Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, welcome in. Happy Sunday morning. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. This is Winning Cures Everything. Turn down the sweet jams. And this is the College Football Week 6 Recap Show. As always, brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They've got six incredible sports books. You can go find them over at tunicatravel.com. Chris, this is a fun weekend, right? Yeah, I mean... It was okay. It, it was it was a it was a good weekend. It was a good setup for next week, which is going to be massive, absolutely massive. I mean, there's some humongous matchups next week. Uh, some that would have been bigger had other teams won, as opposed to not. But uh, but I mean, there were some fun games and and a lot of big time stuff that that kind of sets the mood for the rest of October. This is when you you separate the pretenders from the. Uh, from the actual contenders. And I think you could see that with a lot of these games. Now, before we get into anything, of course, you can find us over at winningcureseverything.com. You can subscribe on the YouTube. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcast app is. Go hit subscribe. Leave a nice review for us. We would definitely appreciate that. And then if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe and make sure you comment in. Tell us what you think about the show. Tell us what you think about the picks. Tell us what your picks are, etc. We like to hear from you. We want you in. Uh, every week we do a pick'em contest. Uh, so far, we've got one person that has picked six of the seven games, and we've got three more today for the NFL. So, lots to uh, to discuss there. But yeah, you can join in on that if you would. Go and sign up for the newsletter. Now, I've been telling everybody about this. The newsletter is the only way to get the the metric sheet for college football and the NFL. Dude, I'm going to go on and tell you. College football, the first three weeks, it was 64 and 75 against the spread. That's only a 46% win rate, right? Not great. So if you're just a regular Joe Schmo, $5 better, you bet on every single game, you would have been down $73.80. However, over the last three weeks, that metric sheet has gone 88 and 57 against the spread. That is 60.69%. $5 better on every game would have won $115.40. That is a net profit for the entire season. If you had bet every single college football game, you would have won $41.60 off of just being a $5 better. That's a pretty good return on investment, right? Yep. Not too shabby. So if you feel like having a rooting interest in literally all 40-plus whatever odd games on college football you know, weeks... This is the way to go about it. Uh, but yeah, you, you can get that exclusively in the Winning Cures Everything newsletter. Go check that bad boy out. Chris, let's fire into this. Florida and Auburn. Now, Florida wins 24 to 13. Before I give out a bunch of stats, do you want to uh do you want to jump in with a, a thought on this? I mean, no, I mean it was a it was exactly what I thought it was gonna be, which is a hard, hard fought defensive game low scoring and and the scoring Florida had was due to turnovers and their defense getting them in great you know field position or or the busted play at the end of the uh or not the end of the game but the fourth quarter yeah uh Bo Nix was 11 out of 27 145 yards one touchdown three picks Kyle Trask on the other hand 19 out of 31 234 yards two touchdowns zero picks the injury that he had I thought he was done I thought it was yeah, done for the rest too. of the game. And, you know, you had Emory Jones come in, looked pretty good, and went five out of seven. But the the big portion of this is that Florida was actually able to run the ball at least some, which took pressure off of the quarterback. Correct. Um, LaMichael P. Ryan, 14 rushes, 130 yards. Now, one of those was an 88-yard touchdown that he ran right into the middle of the pile and bounced it out and just yeah. outran everybody. Just somehow came out of it, and yeah, you're right. Just took off. Yeah, it was absolutely insane. Uh, it was fun to watch. This was a fun, fun game to that watch. That, game. Two really good teams. Two really good football. Yes, teams. yes. It was. Uh, you know, Auburn. I'm. I'm looking at them. I don't think as poorly of them as I thought I would had they gotten beat. 
right? So yeah. going in, like I said on the show last week, if Auburn loses this, if they don't cover, like I'm done with them. That's it. You know, this is a crap football team, whatever. I, I don't really feel like that. I, I feel yeah. like yeah. they had a freshman quarterback in a spot, and you and I have talked about this before. We You and I argued about this, about freshman quarterbacks, and sometimes they're really good, but, but sometimes they just have a day. You know, they just they just have a date. But every quarterback that has played this Florida team, no matter what what age they are, look like this. So it's just, I mean, you can't you can't say, well, he looked like that because he's a freshman. No, he looked like that because Florida makes quarterbacks look like that. Uh, that's uh, okay. You do have a valid point there. They have got I mean, a fantastic yes, defense. The kid is a freshman. If he was a red shirt sophomore or a true junior, and he looked like this, would it change anything? No. He's still going to throw those picks because the defense baits him. The defense jumped a lot of routes where there's the ball was thrown well. The ball was thrown fine. The receiver was open for a split second, and a DB just made a hell of a move on the football. And now there were some of those. Now, good gracious, the one that he threw in the uh, the end zone, he never even looked at the safety. Safety oh, didn't even no, have yeah. to. No, no, I'm not talking about all of them, but like that, there are times when defensive players are just going to make plays. Yeah. Boys, no, I, I agree. Guys, we talk about it all the time. They've got the dudes to do it. I didn't think Trask would have anywhere close to the kind of game that he had against this Florida, uh, this Auburn defense. And, and the only thing I can think of is so far Auburn's defense has gone up against some, some really good offenses. And they've had to get up and get up and get up. And they've also had to carry the team, which they're going to have to do the, the entire season. Being an LSU fan, this is how our team has been built. My team has been built for forever, and and it's a <laughs> lot of pressure. And all you have to do is have one off drive or busted play like they had at the end, and and it's deflating, it's debilitating because you don't know, you know, your offense isn't going to go out there and hang forty on you. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's that's entirely true. Um, Florida, I definitely don't expect them to hang forty on on anybody other than Tennessee, who they put thirty four on. But uh, but yeah, Florida looked really good. That sets up a massive showdown. Uh, it, there wasn't much to talk about with the LSU-Utah State game, but LSU handles business there 42-6 to uh, six, and sets up a gigantic night game in Death Valley. I know you're excited about it. You, you think um, it's crazy that game day is going to a Florida game twice in a, two weeks in a row? It, a little bit, but, I mean, there's not a bigger game next week. I, like, I don't disagree, but it's just rare that they pick the same team two weeks in a row. Well, it, so have they, they ever done that? They wouldn't. Yeah, I'm sure they have. I I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know that they have. Um, but I, it wouldn't surprise me because like Florida winning last week was a or well yesterday was a massive deal, like just a, a humongous deal because it it puts them in what maybe number seven, number eight range as far as ranking. Um, yeah. And then LSU is a top four team. So, I mean, you got to battle the top eight teams, maybe. Like, it, it doesn't get any bigger, and have, it's on ESPN. I have both those higher than that. I have both those teams higher than that. That's, well, yeah, and so do I. But it, according to AP rankings, whatever, which is what oh, ESPN yeah, uses. They're never going to drop teams that, no matter how good they've looked, they came into the season, preseason something, and they just don't drop them until they yeah. lose, no matter how they look or who they've played. So. Exactly. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be a massive game, uh, and it, it doesn't get any bigger than that. I mean, that's just I, I'm sure that you were excited about it. Of course, LSU once they get done with Florida, then they got to go through the gauntlet of Auburn and yep. Alabama and Texas A and M and what, which A and M just is, this is when the season starts for LSU. I mean, going to Texas was a big big deal. That was nothing to to, to laugh at by any stretch of the imagination. But this is when the season starts. You have got that right. All right, let's move into topic number two. Cincinnati 27, Central Florida 24. This was on Friday night. UCF, four turnovers, and this is kind of a trend here. I know that we talked about the, it, you know, they just make any quarterback look like that. But again, freshman quarterback goes into a hostile road environment. Yet Cincinnati made Cincinnati him look pedestrian. Quarterback. Did you watch the game? That's, I absolutely watched the game. The entire front seven was in the backfield. Not like, yes. not not two or three, the entire front seven was in the backfield as soon as the ball was snapped. Now, that was the play. that was in the second half. In the first half, and think about all of the different times that they got into the red zone because they were scheming against that. 
and and he just made some bad throws once they get down close to the end zone. They, they had so many red zone turnovers, so many missed opportunities. And to Cincinnati's credit, they took advantage of it. That Ritter kid is a tough SOB, man. He is absolutely... It's a good football team. Yeah. No, it, it, what's crazy is that he did not look that good early in the season. And now everybody's saying, well, he's healthy now. He's 100%, et cetera. And I'm trying to figure out why... Like, I guess if you're 70%, you can play. You just yeah. don't look as good. That's right. But how can you heal while you're playing? Like, that just seems weird to me. Maybe you can explain it to me. Any, any? Well, I, I don't have an answer for that. God, no, I'm, I'm definitely not a doctor, and I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he, he hadn't missed a game. About the human body. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not gonna pretend. I, I know where it hurts on me all the time because I'm old and I'm out of shape. But no, it, this this is a good football team. This is a really good football team. They're well coached. They don't beat themselves. The only game they've looked bad in was against Ohio State. Yeah, and I don't know that you can fault anybody for that. No, 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 no chance. And I'm not uh, beating this kid up at quarterback for for UCF either. Now Dylan oh. Gabriel, no, he. I'm saying he played fine. There were there were moments where he, he beat looked the hell out of him. Yeah. Oh no, they absolutely did. Cincinnati did run for almost 200 yards. Uh, they just lined up and ran it down their throats. They okay. they are the bigger, more physical team on the line of scrimmage. Uh, there's not a lot of teams that are going to be able to do that to UCF. Cincinnati was. One of maybe two, three on their schedule. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, outside of the, you know, the Navy, I don't know. Well, team that's gonna so you, UCF has to play at Tulane later in the year, and yeah, I will be just, very interested. I was in that just one. about to say, Navy and Tulane would be the only two teams that will line up and be more physical than them and run the football on them. It's the reason I like Cincinnati in this game. It's the reason I bet them. Yeah, is because. I, I thought they were going to slow this game down. I didn't know they'd be able to run on them the way they were, but I knew they would run the football, control the line of scrimmage, control the clock, and minimize possessions because I saw Pitt do that, and 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 I think Cincinnati's a better football team than Pitt. I think Cincinnati's a really good team. I I think they're not getting the credit they deserve, um, and and you know it is what it is. But they're, no, it, they're it a makes good sense. Football team. They're a tough team. And, and they're going to be a tough out in the American. They just are. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. They uh, they close the regular season uh, Thanksgiving week at Memphis, and that is going to be entertaining to watch. Yeah, I'm, I might try to go to that game weather pending. If it's decent outside, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to go to that. I can understand that. All right, let's move on. Topic three, Ohio State 34, Michigan State 10. Not a lot to discuss here. Ohio State led 27 to 10 at the half after a 24 point second quarter. J.K. Dobbins, look, 24 rushes, 172 yards. He is averaging on the season 7.1 yards per carry. Uh, he's ridiculous. He's absolutely ridiculous. Fields, he was only 17 out of 26 for 206 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Uh, Fields made a couple of throws that were really close to being picked off. Yeah. And and if he didn't look as good in this game. Balls away, you know, in, in a game in which you kind of beat the hell out of the other team, he did he did not look great. No, but Michigan State has a tendency to do that, right? They will oh, take yeah, away they, what you're really good at, and or take away your best player. But but to their credit, Ohio State had plenty of options. J.K. Right. Dobbins is an absolute beast. Uh, I don't know that there is anybody on this Ohio State schedule other than maybe Penn State that will be able to line up talent for talent with them. Because I, I think Ohio State has also been able to out-scheme everybody as well. And that, I don't know I'm that they're... interested to watch Ohio State-Wisconsin. Yeah. That's, I, I, I just, I don't think, I don't think Wisconsin's got the athletes. You, you can think that. That's fine. They got dudes up front on both sides of the football. I mean, if they can keep the football away from Ohio State for, you know, 45 minutes out of the ball game. Their front four, their front seven are going to hang too. They're not going to run the ball on them like that. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Um, it's, uh, again, there wasn't a whole lot to discuss there, but let's uh, let's keep in the Big Ten, and we'll move on over to Michigan 10, Iowa 3. Now, did you watch this game? I did. I watched all of this game. Now, you and I enjoy defensive struggles. We do. 
But man, there was something about this one that was just a little icky feeling. It, no, like, I liked it. it I, I, I watched it. I enjoyed it. it. The way that Michigan was able to get into the backfield like was just ridiculous. But Iowa that, could not block what them. We've expected M- Michigan to be the entire year, and they haven't been that yet. Right. Uh, 261 total yards for Iowa, 267 yards for Michigan. Iowa had 30 rushes for one net yard. Now, you, of course, disagree with this statistic uh, where sacks are taken out of the rushing total. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that should, they should always go against the passing total. The NFL has yeah. it right, college football has it wrong. Yeah, so That's it is, truth. it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. Iowa, like Nate Stanley did not look good. He had three interceptions in this game. Iowa could get basically nothing going. Every time, the last drive of the game, where they, or I guess the second to last, was it the second to last where they had so many penalties? They get down yeah, to... Yeah, no, yeah, when they had three penalties in a row in the red zone. You know, yeah, you know Kirk Ferentz had to be, well, and they weren't quite to the red zone yet, but they, I think they were on like, what, the 25 or 24 or something yeah, like that. So they were really close yeah. to end up on the other side of the 50. Which is just, you know, Kurt Ferentz had steam pouring out of his ears. Yes. I that mean, is, that, that is not Iowa football. And I wonder, A, is that a, this Michigan defense has the offense so frazzled, there is no being disciplined, there is no maintaining composure, or is it just one of those situations where the guys at offense were so frustrated they couldn't get anything going that, People are just way overzealous, just trying to make something happen. I, I think it was I probably a combination. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't know the answer, but but it was very un, yeah, Iowa-like, very yeah. un-Kurt Ferentz team-like. It's, to see them score 48 points last week, now granted, that was Middle Tennessee State. Yeah, I get it. They, they win 48-3, to three, and then you go to Michigan, who has not looked great this year, and you can only put up three points. Uh, it, it was not efficient. It didn't look good, and now I always got to go and handle Penn State next week. Yeah, that's you know? going to be a tough game. Now they they do good at home, so like that's good. But man, that's a, that was a that was a rough one to watch. It just the amount of times that Michigan was able to get into the backfield and and kind of close that pocket on Nate Stanley, it made me so uncomfortable. I don't know what it was about it. Like every time I watched them get back there, I was like, no, <laughs> like somebody blocked somebody. And they just no, could I mean, not do it. This is the Michigan defense we've been looking for all year. Michigan's going to win. If they're going to win, they're going to do it on defense. They're not going to do it on offense. It's just not going to work. Yeah. Shea Patterson's not the best quarterback on that team, and I don't know why they refuse to make the change. Well, and so and Dylan McCaffrey's got a concussion, right? He was in concussion protocol. So I, so I was asking that to, to some people yesterday, texting with them. Is McCaffrey healthy is the question I asked. And the response was, even if he's not healthy, he's got to be a better option. But if it's a concussion situation, then that's different. Yeah. He's out. Yeah, they, they, they had put him in in the last game, and and yeah. he got knocked out of that one. And so, uh, let's move on. We're going to move over to the Big 12. And I know that you're excited to talk about this. Baylor Rule, 31. If we say what? Matt Rule, baby. I believe that. Baylor 31, Kansas State 12. Now, I, I was convinced that Kansas State would probably win this game because Baylor had such a massive game last week. And and there were still skeptics last week of, okay, this was a fun game between Baylor and Iowa State. But, I mean, really, how good are these two teams, et cetera? Well, it, you found out this week, Iowa State beat TCU yeah. 49-24. They're pretty good. Both of these teams are really damn good, and there is a clear divide between the top four teams in the Big 12 no and doubt. everybody else. It, it ends at Iowa State. That's yeah. right. And it's and, and how is, that is and the chasm is getting bigger. Yes. At how insane is it that Iowa State is the fourth out of those? <laughs> <laughs> like that's a really good football team. Yeah. And they and they've already Bears got two second. Oh man. So uh, Baylor. It, we'll see what happens next week. Obviously, you've got Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, it would not shock me to see Texas win that game. They do it pretty regularly, even when they're complete crap. I don't know. This Oklahoma team's different than the last couple. It, I agreed. Their defense does look a lot better than they have. Um, but going back to Baylor, you know, Charlie Brewer, 14 out of 23, 230 yards, one touchdown. Uh, they they just 
handled this game they no do problem. It on the ground and they do it with defense. And that is a what did Matt Rule do at Temple? He made it was they were the most physical team I've ever seen play without having like super athletic dudes. Yeah, that, they were, were they were just tough, and strong and fast. Yes, if that guy ever took over an SEC football team that could get big athletic freak dudes. It would be scary. Yeah. It really would be scary. Because even at Baylor, they get speed like nobody's business. They get skill players like nobody's business. He's bringing in some strong dudes, some tough guys. I know they're tough, but they don't have the athletic ability that Alabama, Florida, Georgia, LSU, even Tennessee, and, and, and these other Mississippi State schools like that are bringing in. Auburn, if, if Matt Rule took over a program with that kind of athlete that was that big and strong and fast, I don't yeah. know if anybody's beating them. I don't know if anybody's beating them. No, I think I think you're probably right. They're I mean, it, it was against Texas. They're going to struggle against Oklahoma because both those teams are far superior athletically. But I don't know that they lose both those games. I could easily see them splitting that series. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, Iowa State on the other side. I mean, just handled TCU yes. like it was nothing. Oh man. Uh, Brock Purdy. Listen to this game. 19 out of 24, 247 yards passing, two touchdowns. On top of that, he had 12 carries for 102 yards and two more touchdowns. Like, the kid was unstoppable. When he has games like that, there's no stopping that team. No. He's he's really, really good at football. And and last week, Baylor just made him look bad. And and that's fine. That's going to happen sometimes. I give credit to Baylor and don't knock him at all for that. He showed this week, yeah. Don't question me. It was it wasn't me. That other team took it away. I play anybody else. It's, I, I hate that that game was was so early in the season and there was no hype for it because that was a fantastic football team. But there, uh, football there game should have been. Hang on, there should have been hype. There absolutely should have been hype. Well, I think that's, there would have been that's more shame on the media people. That's shame on people that talk about this stuff. Our guys at ESPN bearing those guys. That, 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 that's on them to, yeah. to hype that game up. It doesn't matter that it's early, it's early in the season. It's week five. Like, uh, props to uh, props to Chris Felica. And that, no, I'm saying I understand it's week five. I'm, I'm wishing that was a week 10, week 11, week 12 kind of game because no. it's so massive, right? Because that, that's going to alter – that, it, but it's going to alter standings. It's going to alter every – I wish that there was more buildup because these two teams are going to keep winning. And I wish that it was just a, a bigger game – but instead, it was kind of an afterthought last week. Well, that it was only an afterthought to those who don't pay attention to the sport. I just well, yeah. disagree. We're just going to disagree there. I mean, no, no, no. I, I, I'm, is a massive game. It's week six. It's this is no disagreement. That's no disagreement. All I'm saying is that I, for the the mainstream fans that don't pay attention as much, I wish if there was, was more. Week put, ten or week twelve, and both of them had a loss against. Let's say they split against Oklahoma and Texas. Both of them do. All right, and they both come in with one loss apiece. That game's not as big as last week. I think. Though, I think. I guess. Yeah, but they they both play Oklahoma and Texas. They they both play Oklahoma and Texas like late in the year, like at the end of the season. It just happens that way. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. It's like you could have played it just a touch before that to make it where they're both, you know, six and one or six and zero uh, oh and whatever. I think it's just fine, and and the, it didn't get the build up because people didn't give it the credit it deserved. Yeah, and that's shame on those people, not on those schools. Now you you're right. You, no, no, no. It's, I'm not blaming the schools for that at all. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this. We're gonna move out to Pac-12 after dark. Did you did you stay up for this Stanford oh, no. and Washington? No, this game is boring. It's boring. At halftime, I was like, I'm going to bed. Stan, let me let me read you some stats here. Stanford was before this game. 111th in rushing offense, 99th in yards per carry, 116th overall offense. They were down to only six healthy offensive linemen on the team. They had their Lost third one last night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's what I'm saying. They they got down to six. Uh, oh, okay. And then they were down to their third string quarterback. And this team pushed Washington around to the tune of about 500 yards. That is. Inexcusable. I don't have an answer for that. That it it's like and so I saw somebody, I think maybe it was Stuart Mandel or, or somebody else, um, tweeted last night and said, it's almost like the Pac twelve just erases all of their history 
Like they just, they go into every week and it's just kind of a roll of the dice and you never know who's going to show up or what's going to happen or anything. And I cannot understand. Like, I'll tell you this. I did bet Stanford last night. <laughs> when that line got to like plus 16 and a half, I thought, man, that is absurd. Like, I understand Stanford's really bad, but I'm also like Stanford's at home and they always play Washington tough. And I think people are just overvaluing this Washington team a little bit. Jacob Eason looked terrible in some of these spots. And it wasn't that Stanford was getting a ton of pressure on it, but they, they got pressure in spots. But, man, some of the, the, the throws that he was making were just absurd. Like, he could not hit his receivers. Uh, he was throwing the ball behind him. He was just all over the place, and I can't figure out what's going on with him. He's got a hell of an arm, but, man, he's got some serious problems. And now, good luck telling me who's going to win the Pac-12 North uh, other than Oregon, which didn't look great against a uh, against the Cal team that was missing their starting quarterback. So, if you bet money line against oh, – just, just, I'm just going to start betting the money line against every dog in the Pac-12. I mean, that's just, that's just what you're going to do. Yeah, I mean, this past week you would have went three and one if you bet all the money line dogs. Last week you would have only won two games, but they would have been a decent payout. Um, two of the five, so you're doing two and three. The week before that you'd have went one, two. Maybe you just round robbing them. Three. That's what I'm saying. Three, <laughs> four. You would have went four and two the week before that. So in just three weeks, four, seven, eight. Nine, you would have been nine and and like and like five. Yeah, and That's if you incredible. if you round robin That's parlay them, some of these are hella payouts. Yeah, I mean there's massive payouts. So it's it's they're plus three fifty or better. It's completely absurd, and I I just but the Pac twelve does this every year. They cannibalize themselves. I That's why I'm, I, I kind of hate myself that it was it was last night when I kind of thought about. And I see Cal, you know, giving Oregon, Oregon all they want. And I'm thinking, I, I kind of should have put a math together on this beforehand. The Pac-12 the pack is just so up and down. Literally, any team can beat any team any week. There is no big dog. And there really isn't that bad of a bottom feeder. Yeah. Like, they don't have a top and a bottom. They just have a big-ass middle. And there are varying degrees, but it only depends on what week they are. Now, you're right about that. underdog on the money line. Doesn't matter if they're playing an auto conference team. Doesn't matter. Whoever the underdog is in the game, you just bet them. Yeah. Now you're you're right. You're 100 right. You're gonna get good payouts. You're gonna get good odds, and you're well over 50 percent anyway. So you're on the positive side of the vig, heavily. Heavily. You're well over 50 percent. Now you were you were right about that. I'm just I'm just doing that blind from here on out. That's just that's what I'm doing the rest of the weekends. So. Let's I'll uh, let you know how it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> if favorite starts coming in, I'm screwed. But that's a, yeah, but I, but so far we doubt it, right? No. Uh, let's move on to some more Big Twelve talk. You know, we talked about how there's a clear divide between the contenders and pretenders. These two are pretty much contenders: Texas 42, West Virginia 31, and Oklahoma beats Kansas 45 to 20. Uh, Texas was outgained. By West Virginia. This this game was strange to watch. I don't know if you watched any of this one. I had it on. I watched a lot of it. Um, well, and it was fun because it went back and forth. Like the whole ball game. And West Virginia, you know, got it within four. And then Texas scored. And then Texas scored to put it 35 to 17. Yeah. And, when that happened, it was over. Yeah. And well, and then what's nuts is like that you're, you're looking at the spread, right? So depending on where you got it, you got it at either 10 and a half, 11 or 11 and a half for Texas. And it's kind of crazy that, that it tends to come down to this number pretty frequently, but Texas goes up with a touchdown to go up 42 to 24 with three minutes left in the game. And West Virginia drives it right down the field and scores to make it 42 to 31. So depending on what side of the 11 you were on you either had a really good game or a really bad game. Um, but Texas does this, and they're going to continue to do this because their defense is just out. Like they, the good thing is their offense can continue to do this. I, I think that's why I think it's maybe not laughable. It's not the right word. 
I just don't think this Texas this Texas team can beat Oklahoma. And the reason being is because if that defense yeah. rolls into the Red River robbery, they Oklahoma's putting up 70. They just going to score every every drive and every drive is going to take 2 minutes. Yeah. I mean, at Texas it, Texas they're was outgained. Fast it was fast and they're scoring every drive. Texas had 427 yards. 216 of that was rushing, by the way. Everybody was concerned about the rushing attack. Rushing attack's fine. Uh, but West Virginia. Mm, I'd be careful about saying it's fine. It looked fine against West Virginia, but everybody's ran in West Virginia. That's uh, true. True. You got a point, but everybody. And Holgerson spent five, six years of just completely ignoring the defense. So that defensive side of the ball has no talent at all. No, I mean, you, you're you're entirely right. Uh, but if you, you look over at the, you know, Oklahoma-Kansas uh, game, I mean, Kansas oh, had 130 oh, rushing yards on them. Trick plays to get points on the board. That, that's true. That's your boy that's Les insane. doing it up, doing it up. So I, I think next week is going to be a lot of fun. It sets up a, a Red River showdown that's uh, going to be a lot of fun, I think. That's where I thought game day was going, just for the simple fact that they were at Florida last week. That's, that's all. I just I, thought this is a big enough rivalry game to where you can say we won't go to the best game of the weekend because – I don't know that it's necessarily the best game of the weekend. And I, you know, I think this rivalry holds enough water to justify saying we can go there no matter what else is on TV and not piss anybody off. I, I also my, think that was my argument. And my thought, I was a hundred percent certain they were, I'm very glad they're coming to LSU. Not upset about that. Not complaining about that. I just find it strange that they're going to Florida two weeks in a row, like the same team two weeks in a row is just weird to me. I, I mean, it's definitely Georgia strange. We just heard all the Florida stories and, and all the, you know, the whole game day experience with Florida. Yeah, but now you get it for LSU. There. Yeah. So it, the, the difference is I think ESPN already threw Fox a bone with Iowa, Iowa State. And now because Red River's on Fox again, like they've gone to Red River a lot. Like they go, it, it's almost every year. <laughs> Like it's, yeah, but they also go to the Iron Bowl every year because it's a big rivalry. They also try to go to the game every year because it's a it's one of the country's big biggest rivalries. Well, yeah, but those those two that you were talking about, like those those two are on the same weekend, right? Well, yeah. So, so they have to basically they alternate every other year which one they're going to go to, and or they go to the one that matters the most at that point in time. Yeah. And this this is owned by itself. And because it's owned by itself, there's usually nothing else that can compete or stand with it. And, and next week. earns that reputation. I mean, there is a lot that will compete with it next week. I mean, it's just because it's not just Florida and whatever. It's uh, just a quick run through. So on Friday, you got Virginia and Miami, Colorado, Oregon. You got Alabama A&M. You got Oklahoma, Texas. You got Florida State, Clemson, which, God, I wish Florida State was in a better position. Uh, Michigan State, Wisconsin. Washington State, Arizona State, USC, Notre Dame, Penn State, Iowa, uh, Florida, LSU, Utah, Oregon State, Hawaii, which I, some of these I'm just throwing out. But yeah, uh, none of those games are as close to LSU, Florida, and and, 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 and Oklahoma, and, Texas, and, and and Oklahoma, Texas. None of them. So and they're I, not, I they're going to be good games. They're going to be awesome to watch. They're going to be awesome to talk about. And, and all of this, that's probably going to be the best game. A because no defense is going to be played. Z- zero defense. Uh, yeah, you're probably played. right there. I mean, You're probably they're going to have over a hundred total points. It's going to hit over hundred. Both these teams hitting fifty. I am super interested to see exactly what LSU's offense is going to be able to do against Florida's defense. Oh, me too. Because Florida's defense looked really, really good. This is this is going to be where where Joe Joe going to have to either stand up or sit down. Yeah. That's it. We're going to find out who he is this week. You are right about that. All right, let's move into topic number eight. Group of five New Year's Six candidates. Now, we don't talk about this all the time, but obviously you and I, big fans of the Group of Five conferences, wearing my App State shirt today, of course. They didn't play this week, but here's what we got. Boise State won last night 38-13 to over UNLV. SMU with a comeback for the ages. And Tulsa just completely, that game away, completely choked. And... So they win 43-37 in triple overtime. Memphis wins 55-32 to at, or 55-33, whatever. Whatever the numbers were, they win at Louisiana Monroe. Uh, App State was off, but Cincinnati, of course, gets the big win. It's I think it's going to be tough for Cincy 
because that, that oh, Ohio State game was... That one loss to Ohio State, if you're only lost to Ohio State and you win the American, I, I know the other team is an undefeated Boise, that is horse crap. A, Boise won't have a tough game the rest of the year. That's close to what the American teams are going to play. No, I, I, I think, look, the Mountain West SMU, is good. SMU, Central Florida, not going anywhere, and, and, uh, and, and Cincinnati and Memphis are four legit teams that would hang in all Power Five conferences right now. Yeah. No, I, I they agree. Would beat the Alabamas and the Ohio States, so they would hang. They ain't nobody else. They'd hang with everybody else. take the blue chips out of those conferences, they're just as good as everybody else in those conferences. I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm just it, coming from a, an outside perspective. That's going to be tough for some people to get over. Now, I think if it's their only loss and they roll through the rest of this AAC schedule, then – Absolutely. I think that they will be higher ranked because I, I do think Boise could end up with a loss somewhere. I don't know where, but they, they've don't. they've had some spots. That's it. Man, they still got to play Fresno. They still got to play Utah State. They still got, you know. Those, te- those teams aren't close to as good as Boise. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Now, there's, a, I, there's a massive separation between talent in those teams. Uh, Tulane I brought up because they, they do have the one loss to Auburn, but they kept that one close. Same and it was thing for them. Yeah. They go undefeated the rest of the way. The the Americans just stacked. I left them out of that four team mix. There's five. Yeah. The, the American is absolutely loaded. People who crap on it just don't understand football and they don't watch football. The American is better than the ACC right now. It's better than the Pac 12 right now. Today, it's better than two conferences. I think the top part is. I think the, the bottom part is. Well, they, 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 so There's the not as much depth. Part of the Americans worse that well, yes, the Pac-12 doesn't have a top or a bottom. That's a big middle. Yeah, the ACC really. I, I you don't mean, think the bottom teams could hang with the bottom teams in the ACC because those teams are trash. Well, some of them are, but I mean, NC State like they still walloped East Carolina. Like it, you know, th- those kind of games will still happen. Um, you know, I, I I don't know. And all we care about is the top part. By the way, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, it, the, you care about the that fact. The top four, top five teams in the conference, and, and five, that's what... They're five deep. Are there five deep in, in the ACC? So Clemson beats the best team in the American. Let's take that out. Well, it, so after this, yeah. I'm actually going to talk about the ACC. So let's let's go ahead and finish up with this. The reason that I bring up the group of five stuff, we've got a banger on Thursday night coming up. And I, you don't know what game it is yet, do you? No, I haven't, I haven't looked at last next week's schedule at all, Hartley. We've got App State going to Louisiana on Thursday night. We got Billy Napier. We got Eli Drinkwitz. We, I mean, this is going to be a massive, massive game because Louisiana has that one loss to Mississippi State, and it was a 10-point loss, but they have been obliterating people. Like, this is a fantastic... I, they are so much better than I thought that they were going to be at this point because I, I had them 7-5 and five this season. You know, it, it, they went 7-7 seven and seven last year. But the way that they are recruiting and the way that this team is playing right now, if they can go undefeated the rest of the way through the season and end with just one loss, I think Louisiana could get it. Mm. Like, there's they, enough they hype about that team. Bo- they would need Boise to lose a game. Oh, yeah. the American to cannibalize themselves. I think any of these teams will need Boise to lose. Like, Boise is in the top 15 just, already. That's going to would. That's gonna piss me off, by the way. I mean, it, Boise goes undefeated. You don't think they deserve the spot? Nope. nope. Uh, you may be nope. right. A <laughs> one-loss American team is better than a Boise team. It just They just are. But they don't have the brand recognition as Boise has, so they're not going to get the credit for it. Uh, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll have to – I'll have to dig through some numbers. May, we might talk about this on the show when we do it on uh, Tuesday night. Um, but I, I think that, like, the Mountain West as a conference is actually rated higher – than the AAC. Now, a lot of that's because of the bottom dwellers, but we can double check into that because it, SMU, of course, is six zero. Which, by the way, only two teams that are that are uh, bowl, uh, well, I guess bowl bound, bowl eligible at this point. SMU and Ohio State. Well, yeah, they haven't had their bye week yet. Exactly, the only two six zero teams in the country on October sixth. Kind of, kind of crazy to think about. It, also, first time that SMU has gone six and zero since nineteen eighty two, since the death penalty. <laughs> so Sonny Dykes is doing a job there. Let's uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next 
the next topic, and you didn't get to watch one of these. Um, Pitt 33, Duke 30 last night. That was that was in Durham. Uh, it was the best game of the weekend. It was. It's not even close. That was the best game. It was the most uh, anxiety riddled, I guess, <laughs> because it's just back and forth, back and forth. A lot of swings uh, in momentum. Uh, the other one is Virginia Tech 42, Miami 35. And this was an ugly football game. The ACC is an absolute mess. Like that's, I, I thought last week that Duke might be the second best team in the ACC. And they, they could still be. But... Yeah, I think, I think they absolutely could be. That's and okay. Uh, that doesn't mean they're great, though. Yeah, if Virginia, I think, still really, really good. Uh, but this, so Pitt goes up 26 to three in this ball game and they allow Duke to come back and take a 30 to 26 lead. Now, I don't know if you saw this. It was 26 to 24 and Duke was going for a two point conversion and they, they got the two point conversion to tie the game. So it was 30 to 26 or uh, 26, 26 and they they signal yeah good he got the he got the two pointer and then they came back out on the field and nobody knew what was going on they, they didn't signal that they were going back to review they didn't like there was no whistle anything like that it was an inadvertent signal from the the field judge that was all the way over back on the sideline at the end of the uh, end zone and he he had stopped the play like he didn't blow his whistle but. He was standing off by himself and did a, like, the, the wipe it off thing where he stopped the play before the kid got into the end zone, and nobody saw it. Nobody knew what was happening, and they, they made him retry the two-point conversion because of that. Like, it was absolutely insane. So they, they retried the two-point conversion. They didn't get it. Then, of course, Pitt... Punts the ball back to him. Duke comes down, scores, takes a 30-26 lead. They don't get that two-point conversion either. And then Pitt, of course, comes down the field, scores a touchdown, wins the game. Uh, it was it was bonkers. Like, there was just so much wrong with what happened there. It would be incredible if the ACC had a network where people could actually watch their games. <laughs> I, I saw you the tweet BC this last night. <laughs> Louisville game was a really good game, too. Yeah. And... All these other conferences have their own network, and they have these TV deals with ESPN or Fox and and ACC. I mean, it would be really nice if they had something like that, or if they admitted something like that, or created it. So, or if maybe yeah. they would even just toss it into ESPN Plus so that you know people could actually something, get it. Something, yeah, without having to bootleg illegally watch TV. Yeah, now you're right about that. Uh, Congratulations, so, ACC. Along with that. Your conference sucks. Yeah. And and now people can't even watch you suck. Virginia yeah. Tech, well, no, 42. Great. That would give them some credibility. Yeah. It would give them some national credibility if people could actually watch this crap. No, you're right about that. Now, people could watch this one because this was on ESPN. Virginia Tech, 42, Miami, 35. Miami, good gracious. The Williams kid, three interceptions and a fumble to start off the game. Went down twenty eight to nothing. Uh, I mean, they they just I, oh, Justin Fuente lives to fight another day. You got that right. Uh, Nikosi Perry, he had let's see, he was twenty eight out of forty seven, four hundred twenty two yards, four touchdowns, one pick, and that's after he did not start the ball game. <laughs> it's just insane. The other kid, the Williams kid. That, that we all thought, okay, well, he looked decent enough against a really good Florida defense. That's right. He came out, he, had, he was four out of seven for like 47 yards. His only three incompletions were all interceptions. And then he got pulled. Like, it just, ugh. It, it's so frustrating. Uh, I don't know what to make of this Miami team. And now, I, I do want to question something really quick. Okay. So, they're down 28 to nothing. They come back, make it 28 to 14. Virginia Tech scores again, make it 35-14, to 14, and this is all, you know, late in the second half. And they went for two, Miami did. And this is midway through the fourth quarter, and they went for two to make it 35-29. to 29. Now, what that did is it set up 
a chance for them to win the game in regulation without having to go for two at that point, right? So you you figure you got a 50-50 shot to to actually hit these two-point conversions. Well, if you go in and do the first one and you don't get it, well, then you can go for two the second time and, and hopefully get it. I'm curious what you think about this because the way that it has been done forever before people started looking at analytics and probability and all that kind of mess is, okay, well, we're down by 14 points. So if we score a touchdown, we're going to kick the extra point, and then we can kick the other extra point, and we can go to overtime. And, like, there's no ties anymore. So it's not like Miami was facing a vastly superior team like North Carolina was last week with Clemson, and you're going to go for two for the win there. I mean, you're at home. You're supposed to be the better team. Why would you... Why would you do this? There was time on the clock, right? Oh, there was plenty of time. Yeah. I I mean, they're they're down 35 to 27. I think you do it because even if you don't get in the end zone again and you can make two stops, two field goals puts it in overtime. But if you you just kick the extra point, then you have to score another touchdown to be able to to either take it to overtime or or have a chance at going for a two-point conversion to win. I don't I don't have a problem with it. I like going for two more than not. I think these teams, when you get down to the two and a half yard line, I think very few defenses have the capability of just shutting the team down. I I, I just I think you're right. I think it's close to 50-50. So therefore if I get it every other time, it's a wash. If I get it 51% of the time, it's a benefit to me. If you've got a good enough offense or you think the other defense is struggling at some point in time, especially in the red zone, especially the goal line, not just red zone, then then you're looking at, you know, a much greater percentage and you get that two or three times in a game, that's the ball game. I mean, that's an extra score for you. So, yeah, it's, it's like playing poker. If you're an advantage player, then that's how you do it, or yes. blackjack. Yeah, you, um, you just care about the advantage. You don't care. It's a math problem. It is. It's analytics. It's a math problem. It's not conventional wisdom. And, and so, yeah, I don't have a problem with it at all. I, now I the, think it's smart. And like I said, there was plenty of time. I thought there was enough time on the clock to where we're going to have two more drives. We make a stop, and they punt to us, and we kick two field goals, and we're in this thing. We don't have to get it in the end zone. We had, They were struggling to score at that point in time to begin with. Yeah. So it's one of those deals where if we can just kick field goals and take it into OT, we're okay. The, uh, the funny part about this is that they did come back and score again, to tie the game, and then Bubba backs and missed the extra point. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it ended up 35-35 anyway. That, I mean, that's that's the other side of it is, is college kickers, man, these extra points aren't gimmies. No, not anymore. I think, they, I, would, it, I think I would rather put, now, of course, their quarterback was struggling greatly. Yeah. But I think I would just trust my offense on the field running another offensive play than putting it in the kicker's hand right now. No, you're, you're probably right. You are probably right. So, like I said, the ACC is a mess right now. I, I don't know. I guess Virginia is the second best team, but of course they Virginia got handled. The second best team, and that, we need to we need to stop playing with that. That's that's the truth. Yeah, that's I, I think I think so. Now that that's not to say that they're not going to lose more games. I think no, that they right will. Now we only can judge them for what we've seen. Yeah, and, and what we've seen is Virginia definitely the second best team. Uh, they do not hurt themselves. <laughs> Of course, they <laughs> turned the ball over five times at Notre Dame. This but, is different. Notre, Notre yeah. Dame is one of the best teams in all of college football. Yeah, they're they're elite. They're definitely elite. Yes, they are. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Topic number ten: Texas Tech forty-five, Oklahoma State thirty-five. Now we this contenders and pretenders line that we drew in the Big Twelve. I think this makes Oklahoma State a pretender. I'll agree with that. I, I really wanted them to be good because it might gun like this offense is still a lot of fun. But when you do have a a younger, inexperienced quarterback, like we talked about so many times already, this is kind of a theme this week. Oklahoma State had two fumbles and three interceptions in this game. Texas Tech had zero turnovers. Jet Duffy, like, yes, he's a backup, but he played a ton last year while Alan Bowman was out then. Now he's playing a lot again. Jet Duffy for Texas Tech, 26 out of 44, 424 yards passing, four touchdowns. He had five rushes for 16 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Spencer Sanders, I think, is a dynamic player. He can absolutely fling the football, man. Like, he can spin that thing like nothing. And yet, he does still make some really questionable decisions. Uh, I was actually 
get my hair cut yesterday, and I was sitting watching this game at Sport Clips, and I saw him throw one of those picks. And I forget, I think it was third quarter maybe. It was it was after halftime. And I just... Yeah. They're down pretty big. Yeah, but I it, the, the decision... Because it's not like... They weren't down so big that you had to stray or you had to, like, take major risks because they were moving the football. Like, that's that's what drove me nuts is that, that you weren't having to take risks to move the ball. Like, Texas Tech's defense isn't that good. And yet, man, he just made some boneheaded decisions. And I think that's kind of what Oklahoma State's offense is this year, right? Chuba Hubbard, still fantastic. I mean, he had, what, 150 rushing yards. Like, he, he went over 1,000 or over 1,100 for the season so far. Um, man, there's there's just a, a clear division between the upper echelon, you know, top four in the Big 12 and then everybody else. Now, the issue is they can all cannibalize each other, right? Um, but, man... That was a that was a tough one to watch, especially after watching Texas Tech get absolutely demolished by Oklahoma last week. Yeah, but that's different. See, I know it's different. different. I know, but it, you'd like to think that Oklahoma State and Oklahoma are at least somewhat no, close. God, no, they're not close. They're not close, Gary. That's uh, I don't know why you're looking at me like that. <laughs> like, because you you have this expectation, like Texas I, Tech's. De- you said Texas Tech's defense not very good. I disagree. I think Texas Tech's defense is really good. And going on the road to Lubbock is a tough place to play right now with a really good defense. I, so I mean, Oklahoma may, beat them up. Okay, you right, you may Oklahoma's be right. Beat up everybody. No, I get. Yeah, Oklahoma is definitely. Who I, else has beat them up? Who else has scored a bunch on them? Uh, Arizona. <laughs> so uh, you know, like, I, it, and that was. I mean, that wasn't exactly like a great Arizona game. Like, but Arizona beat them twenty-eight to fourteen. So yeah, I just, I mean, tw- twenty eighth. No, 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 it's not a lot, but they they had a lot of yards and, and a quarter, so they I, yeah they were able to move the football on them. Um, yeah. so yeah, it was just it was disappointing because I've I've got such high expectations for Oklahoma State. I really thought this was going to be like the bounce back year, and and they had looked really good so far. They had been able to put up points on everybody, uh, but they just kind of ran out of time in this one. But they 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 started moving the ball really well late. Uh, let's move on. Topic number eleven. And this will close this up. And we've got one extra point before our top 10. Georgia 43, Tennessee 14. Now, I don't bring this up to actually have like a massive discussion about the game. Uh, Tennessee kicked Jeremy Banks off the team on Friday. And they they started a freshman quarterback, Brandon uh, Marrer. And this freshman quarterback looked so much better than Justin Guarantano, which... By the way, I think I said that right. I think it's Gorantano, not Gorantano. But man, late in the ball game, Pruitt went back to to Gorantano or Tano. Jesus, <laughs> I'm I'm just confused at because Tennessee came out and had some fight early in this game and they looked led pretty the good. Game the majority of the entire first half, yeah, are tied, and and it was at the very end. Pruitt, I don't know what happened at the very end of the first half of the play calling and the how they botched that to to end up going down by twelve when they were leading the entire way. I, anyway, yeah, that's, that's so much on Pruitt, not these guys. Let let me tell you the difference between because I watched so much of this football game, the difference between Tennessee and everybody else in the SEC. In the SEC, you either have power or you have speed. Many teams have both. Tennessee's wide receivers, the middle of the field was wide open all day long. If I'm Florida, if I'm if I'm everybody else in the SEC watching this film, I'm going to tell you, you can throw on Georgia in the middle of the field all day. They were wide yeah. open. These slant passes were there. They were hitting guys in stride, and they were catching them. Almost any other wide receiver in the SEC at any other school takes those to the house because they split the defenders where both DBs or miss the guy and he wide open and he takes off. Tennessee's wide receivers are so damn slow that they they would barely get three or four steps before five guys were on them. Yeah. And they had the angle. They had the lane. It was clear. They should at least get 
10 to 15 extra yards of yak. And, and they got almost nothing. And that is a huge difference. Now, I have no idea why they pulled the kid that started the game. I, I, don't, I can't get inside. No, I'll, I'll say this. He did, he did look, uh, I'm not going to say rattled. I'm going to say he did not look as efficient once they got down. Right, uh, he you, started. You, you mean you mean a, a really good defensive coach on the other side went in and made an adjusted. Adjustment. Yeah, and it, Tennessee came out and did the exact same thing they did that they were always going to do because they don't make any coaching adjustments whatsoever, and that's on that's on the freshman. What what yeah, was it? It was yeah, uh, not going to take that crap. He started like I want to say eight for eleven or something like that, and then went zero oh for. 11 or 0 for 12 or whatever it was, something crazy after that. And then he ended up having, you know, a pretty good rest of the uh, the night before he got pulled. Uh, now, I think that they may have just pulled the kid because of they were getting blown out. Well, yeah, you you got to see what you can hurt. do. Maybe if you think, all right, we've got a future here. No, they, okay, I'll give him yeah. that. I'll give him that. But I'm so, also yeah, thinking you got to get the kid reps. Bit, uh, nothing to do with the game at all, but just watching this game – and and going through some different stuff and talking to some guys that I was with. Um, Where did you watch this game, by the way? Oh, at home. I didn't leave that. Okay. House. We just okay. had some people over. And uh, I'm. I think I know if I was the athletic director of Tennessee, I know who my next coach would be. I would I would offer Cutcliffe any amount of money he wanted to come. They because, they did that the last time though. <laughs> huh? They they did that uh, before Butch got hired. And and Cookliff yeah, told him he's a long not time ago. But here's the difference is I think in three years they're gonna have an opportunity to get one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. And who is that? And that's Arch Manning. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess now, if you do that then sixty five years old. But I think they need an adult in the room. I think they need somebody to stabilize it. And I it wasn't by the way, it wasn't Fulmer that called Cutcliffe last time. It was somebody else associated with the program. Uh, today, you've got a point there. Today it would be Phil. And I wouldn't lowball him because I also think they tried to lowball him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because they were paying too many coaches. And they're still paying too many coaches, and that's fine. But I, I would I would not well, – I would just – I just wouldn't – I would do what Alabama did to Saban. I would do what – I just would just – fly to him and I'm not we're not leaving until you're on the plane so let's just we're gonna stay here let's just make this work come. and and Cutcliffe's not gonna bring them the national power okay they're not gonna compete for national titles but That's he can fine. build a really good foundation he will he will bridge the gap between 50 feet of crap that they've been forever and making sure they're at least six and six seven and five every year making a bowl game every year and building a, st- a stable program get kids in there that won't get in trouble that will build a a good foundation and then when he's ready to retire they can make a decent hire because that job is now a good job and right now it's a laughing stock now you got a you got a very valid point there the problem is is they took no for an answer and they moved on you just don't you right now you don't do that bad you can't go get the next young gun because that hasn't worked at all the program needs a level of stability before you can do something dynamic with it. Now you're, you're a hundred percent right. I, so I, I agree with everything just you just said. No. I just don't say no. Yeah. I don't take no. Right. It's not honest. That, uh, that wraps up the, the starting 11. Let's move into an extra point here. Nebraska 13, Northwestern 10, uh, ugly football game, but man, if, if Adrian Martinez is out for an extended amount of time, which who knows, Right, but I don't I don't know what the the status is currently, but that that is a bad. It's already not a great football team anyway. I thought the backup played fine. I like it, he's been with Frost forever. I think he's. We have seen this in college football. Backup quarterbacks just don't scare me anymore, man. I, you you may be right, but like we saw it last year. Like it, it I mean, when he yeah, went down, this kid. Yeah, I know. That's like. <laughs> Like you can't compare last year when it was somebody else. That doesn't okay. make sense. I, man, I don't know. I'm, I'm. This is one that we will monitor because if Martinez is out, I don't think that offense runs the same way. And and they need it's that offense. So great, right? 
No, you, you're right about that. Northwestern losing again definitely hurts our over six and a half for the season. Jesus Christ. They got to win. As soon as he goes out, you can't win that game. Yeah, I agree. That's I agree. Team. Um, let's talk about our top ten. Is that uh, you got your top ten ready to roll? Yep. Do you want to do yours first? Sure. All right, go, uh, go on ahead. Ohio State, LSU, Wisconsin, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Bama, Clemson, Notre Dame, Penn State. Okay, That's a, you rolled right through those. <laughs> uh, my top 10. I have got, in the 10 spot, I've got Notre Dame. In the 9 spot, I've got Clemson. 8 spot, I've got Penn State. 7 is Wisconsin. 6, Oklahoma. 5, I moved Florida up to 5. I've got, I have five. I've got Alabama 4, I've got LSU 3, I've got Georgia 2, I've got Ohio State 1. So I think... Uh, I think Ohio State and Georgia are the two most complete teams. I think Georgia can be got, uh, but I also think any of these other teams can be got, other than Ohio State. I think Ohio State's going to win the national championship. Like, I think they are unbelievable right now. I'm, I'm very interested to see them play Wisconsin. I can believe I, I'm interested to see them play against Penn State, against a team that's got comparable athletes. Um, that, 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 too. And, so, and, that, and we get to see both of them. not a great football team, okay? Yeah. Like, they're, they're just not. No? I mean, you're you, – Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. They All haven't right. beat a ranked team yet. No, that's true. That's true. Now, they've killed everybody. They've done what they're supposed to do, but they haven't beat a ranked team yet. Yeah, as far as, like, the efficiency metrics, like, yes, they and Wisconsin both, uh, Ohio State, Wisconsin, have dominated. Absolutely dominated, which is a predictive sign of a really good team. And you saw Wisconsin do it against Michigan, and Iowa is like the the lesser version of Wisconsin right now. The poor man's version of Wisconsin. Yeah, and Michigan handled them. Yeah, absolutely handled them. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a really interesting rest of the season. I can't wait. We're in October. We we started out with a good weekend. College football is rocking and rolling. Week seven is going to be absolute fire. I can't wait for seeing these uh, these bangers next week. Uh, as always, the show brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They got six incredible sports books. We're a fan of all of them. Go check them out for yourself. See what our friends down in the Delta have got for you over at tunicatravel.com. You can find us over at winningcureseverything.com. We will see you guys again, uh, I think, NFL recap uh, Tuesday, I think. Whenever you want to do it. Whenever, whenever we do it. And then, of course, we've got our previews and picks and everything else that will come out as well. Uh, we'll try and have another Friday interview as well that the one with Jeff Ma last week actually turned out pretty good pretty good numbers um so yeah so we we got a lot on the docket go hit subscribe for us over on the podcast leave a nice review on Apple podcast and hit subscribe on YouTube and leave some comments for us tell us what you think about the show Chris I think that's gonna wrap it up let's go watch some NFL buddy see ya Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. 